Archaeologists infer human use of the Gila Trail more than 20,000 years ago from skeletal remains unearthed in 1971 near the California-Mexico border. Evidence abounds that prehistoric peoples traveled the Gila Valley, trading in shells, turquoise, and metal. Probably the first non-Indians to visit this region were Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca and three of his companions. Shipwrecked on the Texas coast in 1528, they wandered almost to the Gulf of California before stumbling into the Spanish outpost of Culiacan in 1536. Inspired by stories that the four had picked up from Indians, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado set out in 1540 in search of the mythical seven golden cities of Cibola. The expedition, which included 225 Spaniards on horseback, 60 foot soldiers, nearly a thousand Indians, and a large herd of livestock, penetrated the future United States as far as Kansas. The adventurers found no gold, but they acquainted the Indians of the northern frontiers with horses and cattle. Catholic missionaries followed the explorers. During the 1600s, the Padres established missions the length of the Rio Grande Valley. Farther west, between 1687 and 1710, the Jesuit priest, Eusebio Francisco Quino, created, out of his enormous energies, a parish of 50,000 square miles, reaching from northern Sonora to the Gila River. Quino built 29 missions, baptized thousands of Indians, and pursued at least 50 of his own explorations along the rim of Christendom. Father Kino was the first to suggest the practicality of overland travel from Tubac to Alta, California. Fray Francisco Garces improved Kino correct when he guided a party of soldiers commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Juan Baptista de Anza westward to the Yuma crossing on the Colorado, then across dunes and mountains to the Los Angeles Basin in 1774. Two years later, Garces accompanied Anza and 200 men, 45 women, and several babies on the Gila Trail as far as the Colorado. Colonists continued north to found the settlements of Yerba Buena, better known today as San Francisco. Thus it was that an already historic path, though little used except by Indians, awaited the first recorded Americans to travel along the Gila. With a dozen other beaver trappers, James Ohio Patty, left Santa Fe in 1825, picked up the river's course and followed it to central Arizona and a point near present-day Phoenix. A few years later with his father, Sylvester, Patty went all the way to San Diego. Not far behind were old Bill Williams, Pauline Weaver, Kit Carson, Baptiste Charbonneau, son of Sacagawea of Lewis and Clark fame, and hundreds of other trappers. These mountain men set the pattern of back-and-forth travel along the Gila Trail. The desert country crossed by the Gila Trail is an overwhelming, enduring reality. If today I am driving to San Diego from San Antonio, there comes a bit west of the 100th meridian, a refueling stop called High Lonesome, where the road conquers a crest and dives into a distinctly different natural realm. Behind lie the almost featureless plains of Texas. Ahead unfolds a thousand mile traverse of rocky hills and harsh valleys of much heat and little water. I may experience air conditioning, comfortable way stations, and irrigated valleys, but for the vast stretches between the infrequent cities, the landscape is shaped by a shortage of rain and an abundance of sunshine. To those who listen, wrote Joseph Woodcrutch, the desert speaks, with an emphasis quite different from that of the plains. It is more likely to provoke awe than to invite conquest. It took a while for such a sensitive view to evolve. Dr. Jonas Griffin, who traveled with Brigadier General Stephen Watts Kearney down the Gila in 1846, wrote, Utterly worthless. The cactus is the only thing that grows. Every bush in this country is full of thorns. Every rock you turn over has a tarantula or centipede. And the most beautiful specimens are rattlesnakes, lizards, and scorpions. A U.S. senator dismissed the region as just like hell. All it lacks is good water and good society. After 1848, when to end the Mexican War, the Republic of Mexico ceded all of Alta California, Nevada, Utah, most of New Mexico, parts of Colorado and Wyoming, and all of Arizona north of the Gila River, the momentum of migration accelerated. During the summer of 1846, just after Congress declared war, Stephen Kearney led troops of the Army of the West from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, to New Mexico and took Santa Fe without resistance. To Kearney, his orders were quite clear. 
quote, Should you conquer and take possession of New Mexico and Upper California, you will establish civil governments therein. He promptly selected his best dragoons for a dash to California. Starting down the Rio Grande Valley, he encountered Kit Carson, Washington bound with news that the coastal province had fallen to American forces. Sending Carson's message on only by courier, and impressing the frontiersmen as his guide, Kearney and a hundred men mounted on mules swung west to the upper Gila River and the mountains through which it cuts. The Gila, rising from alpine ponds and snow-fed springs in the highlands of western New Mexico, crosses the full width of Arizona. Before it was dammed extensively in the last century, the river could change overnight from a shallow, placid stream to a raging flood. For five weeks, Kearney's troops struggled with the upper Gila's mountains and gorges and the lower river's sandy banks and rocky deserts. Once beyond the Gila's confluence with the Colorado River, they faced barren, burning dunes. The men proved tougher than their mounts. Long before the approaches to San Diego, most of the soldiers were afoot. Then, in small but important skirmishes with the Mexican forces, they learned that the war wasn't over after all. Kearney had begun the journey with wagons, but had sent them back to Santa Fe and instructed Lieutenant Colonel Philip St. George Cook, assigned to command the Mormon battalion just arriving from Kansas, to break a wagon trail south of the Gila Mountains. Cook's column included about 350 volunteers, recruited by Brigham Young from the refugees driven out of Nauvoo, Illinois plus their officers, five officers' wives, and twenty wagons. Battalion followed the Rio Grande, then cut southwest across a tableland studded with peaks where no American wheel had ever turned. A regular army officer respected by the Mormons as a, quote, strict but impartial, brave but austere, with a firm manner of speech, Cook carried his command over the southern spur of the Rockies on curses and curtailed rations. Once beyond that obstacle, he pressed westward from waterhole to waterhole until he found the San Pedro River. There, the Mormons were attacked by longhorn bulls gone feral from ranches abandoned in the wake of Apache raids. Two days and 65 miles north on the San Pedro, the column turned west and crossed a tableland to the Mexican garrison settlement of Tucson. After camping briefly outside the town, its soldiers and most of its 500 civilians had fled. The battalion walked northwest along the dry bed of the Santa Cruz River to reach the Gila. Refreshed by the hospitality of the prosperous Pima and Maricopa Indians, the men resumed their march. Rather than trace the great curving course of the Gila through central Arizona, they cut west across 40 waterless miles, forcing wagons over ridges in an, quote, unremitting struggle with the root barrenness of a rainless wilderness, unquote. Intercepting the river again near today's town of Gila Bend, they proceeded west along its channel despite sand, gullies, and thickets because of the grass and the water it provided. In early January 1847, the battalion rafted across the Colorado River. Then, the half-starved and worn-out men had to suffer through the bottomless dunes west of present-day Yuma. Barefoot, they staggered as they marched. Three hot days and cold nights, men and animals struggled on without drink. Even as they anticipated the friendlier ground of California's mountain valleys, new obstacles appeared. High rugged ridges and the maddening box canyon, one foot too narrow for the wagons. With axes and a single crowbar, the men led by Cook himself, hewed a wider passage from solid rock. Ragged and fainting, the Mormons with eight wagons intact finally arrived at Warner's Ranch, a paradise of provisions and warm mineral springs. This California oasis was near the end of the Gila Trail, where travelers at last divided to go on their various ways. To many exhausted immigrants, the oak trees and wells of Warner's Ranch must have seemed a perpetual desert mirage turned into reality. Kearney's dragoons billeted with the lanky Connecticut Yankee, Jonathan Trumbull Warner. In the next 30 years, more than 200,000 travelers stopped to rest, resupply themselves at the store, and perhaps visit the hot sulfurous springs beside Eagle's Nest Peak. History may be searched in vain for an equal march of infantry, Cook declared in an order congratulating his men when they at last arrived at San Diego. It had covered 2,000 miles from the Missouri River to the Pacific Ocean, a thousand of that in 110 days through arid primitive wilderness. Only the Battle of the Bulls had tested the Mormons' fighting prowess, but behind them they left a wagon route that with some variations would attract cattlemen, immigrants, surveyors, military commanders, prospectors, mail couriers, freighters, and, most important in the shaping of the U.S.-Mexican border, the builders of the Transcontinental Railroad. 
Yet failing to anticipate these American interests, the 1848 treaty that ended the Mexican War proclaimed the Gila River as the international boundary. But reports and maps of Kearney's and Cook's expeditions publicized the southern route. On the heels of the Mormons, T.J. Trummer drove 500 Longhorns from eastern Texas to California through Mexican territory. Soon, the Gila Trail became a river of livestock flowing towards the high prices in the new gold fields of California. Many a gold feverish 49er headed for the Gila Trail by way of the Santa Fe Trail, or across Texas from the Arkansas River, or from San Antonio through El Paso and its low gap in the mountains. Given the alternatives, the Great Basin Deserts and Snowy Peaks, or the sea route around Cape Horn, or the tropical traverse of Central America, the Gila Trail seemed a reasonable response. Nevertheless, the hazards as well as the hardships were great, and dozens of travelers perished of the heat and thirst or were killed by the Indians. In 1851, the Roy Siltman family left the protection of a wagon train at Tucson and broached the desert flatlands. West of Gila Bend, a band of Yavapais fell upon them, killing the parents and four of the seven children. Boy escaped, but of the two captured girls, one survived and was eventually rescued. Survivor of the Indian Massacre and five years' captivity, Olive Oatman, her chin marked by tattoos, stands for a portrait nearly ten years later. Olive lived as a slave among the Indians until 1856 when an Indian traded her to a white man for horses, food, and blankets. Published accounts of the tortures inflicted on the Oatman girls were widely read later by California-bound Americans, but they came on anyway. By 1852, the ferries on the Colorado at Yuma had transported across the river an estimated 60,000 immigrants, at first on reed rafts pulled by swimming Indians and later on barges attached to pulley ropes. In 1853, James Gadsden, American minister to Mexico, negotiated for the United States the purchase of a strip of land south of the Gila, encompassing a proposed railroad route to the Pacific, as well as the trail already used by thousands of gold seekers. Of the nearly 30,000 square mile area, Kit Carson grumped, quote, a wolf could not make a living on it. But many an adventurous American was willing to try. One was Charles D. Poston, a Kentucky lawyer who in 1856 revived the Spanish compound of Tuba, discovered a vein of silver nearby, and thereafter ran a fiefdom financed with the rich ore. In 1861, when the departure of Union troops left Tubac defenseless against the Apaches, the historic town was again abandoned. Poston, long called the father of Arizona for his work to separate it from the territory of New Mexico, died in squalor. But at his zenith, he was elected territorial delegate to Congress, ordered a massive silver inkstand from Tiffany's, consulted with President Lincoln, and dined in London with Mark Twain. With figures like Poston, Demand grew among such influential Westerners for some regular communication with the East. Congress responded first with a subsidy for a twice-monthly runs by the San Antonio and San Diego mail line, dubbed the Jackass Mail, for its use of mules. But the transportation marvel of the time turned out to be John Butterfield's Overland Mail. At its peak, it had more than 250 coaches and several hundred wagons, about 2,000 employees, 1,800 horses, and mules, and 240 state stations spaced along a 2,800-mile route. The government awarded Butterfield a $600,000 a year federal subsidy for mail service from St. Louis to Franklin, Texas, present-day El Paso, thence along the new road to Fort Yuma, thence to San Francisco, California, and back twice a week in good four-horse post coaches or spring wagons, suitable for the conveyance of passengers as well as the safety and security of the mail. The new road just being started was an improved federal wagon route for freight running from El Paso to Yuma, but instead of following it all the way, the Butterfield stages went through Apache Pass, a shortcut to Tucson. From the outset, the Butterfield kept within its schedule. Stages were laid at the end of the line only three times in nearly three years. Drivers using language that placed blasphemy as a comparative light offense completed the first westward run, 23 days, 23 hours, and 30 minutes. Remarkably, Butterfield's coaches were never attacked by Indians until the final month. It happened at Apache Pass in early 1861, when the express service was already doomed by the growing threat of Southern secession. But until then, armed to the teeth passengers were more endangered by rocky roads, mud holes, desert sands, and swollen streams 
than by the Apaches. Journalist Waterman L. Ormsby of the New York Herald scribbled feelingly of the, quote, heavy mail wagon whizzing and whirling over the jagged rock in comparative darkness, unquote. Sleep was at first impossible for him, but after three days, he lay down and was quite oblivious. Always worked the excitement of pounding into Tucson enveloped in bugle calls and billows of dust, changing horses, and then hurtling on toward the Pacific. The record of the Overland Mail in maintaining its schedule is the more surprising considering the potential opposition. Somewhere between 500 and 1,500 Apache fighting men roamed across southern Arizona, southern New Mexico, and southwestern Texas. With their guerrilla tactics, the Apaches had hindered the Spanish and Mexican development of the border country for nearly 200 years. The relentless raids on the ranchos were so effective that by the time of the Gadsden Purchase in 1853, some of the areas were almost entirely depopulated. American newcomers at first had to contend with the same difficulties, but in 1856, a newly appointed Indian agent, Dr. Michael Steck, began regular distributions of food, dry goods, and agricultural tools. Soon, he had gained the Apache's promise that the Gila Trail stagecoaches, freight caravans, and emigrant wagons would be left alone. Except for routine thievery, the promise was fairly kept for nearly five years. Then one day in January of 1861, the unsteady peace fell apart. Second Lieutenant George N. Boscom, in command of a detachment of infantry, accused Cochise of abducting a rancher's stepson and stealing some cattle. At their confrontation at Apache Pass, Cochise resisted arrest and escaped, but six of his followers were held prisoner. Furious, Cochise and a large band unsuccessfully attacked a Butterfield stage, then seized white hostages, three from a wagon train after tying eight others to wheels and burning them to death, and three more from the stage station. Unable to effect an exchange, the Indians killed their hostages. In retaliation, Lieutenant Boscom hanged the Apaches he held, and so began a dozen years of renewed warfare, merciless and mindless in the extreme on both sides. The settlers accused Apaches of cruelties, the most vindictive revenges, widespread injuries ever perpetrated by an American Indian. Yet when the aging Apache leader, Mangus Coloradas, was taken into army custody, he was shot dead by his guards. When he forcefully complained, so witnesses said, about the other soldiers touching his feet with red-hot bayonets while he slept. March 1861, with the Civil War clouds gathering over the United States, northern pressures to transfer the stage service to a St. Louis, Salt Lake City, and then Sacramento route were successful, and the Butterfield operations abruptly ended. All the next year, as Union troops maneuvered to foil the Confederates' invasion of the Southwest, the Apaches increased their depredations. Throughout the years of the Civil War, Arizona was washed in blood. Eventually, the Apaches killed or drove out most of the settlers and miners not living in the towns. At the war's end, national attention focused again on the frontier, beginning years of confusion and disagreement on how to deal with the Apaches. Most of the residents of the Southwest, abandoned by Union troops to endure the Apache raids alone, favored extermination. Army officers facilitated between aggressive pursuit and offers of peace treaties. Easterners and the government's Indian Bureau called for the settling of Apaches on reservations. Meanwhile, small bands of hostiles raided some outlying settlements or attacked some minor cowboy or traveler almost every day. In the 1870s, the reservation plan won. The Apache who surrendered were to be fed and protected. Those who did not were to be hunted and killed. In response, thousands of Indians came into small, localized reserves. But when others refused and continued their looting and killing, Brigadier General George Crook launched one of the most effective campaigns in the history of the Indian Wars. In two months, his highly mobile cavalry units, guided by loyal Apache scouts, repeatedly caught groups of Indians by surprise. By the spring, the survivors, many of them starving, were walking into the reservations by the hundred, and it appeared that the principal resistance had at last been crushed. When a year later, several runaway bands resumed their pattern of theft and murder, crook scouts and the horse soldiers sought them out and whooped them again. In 1875, as Crook was being transferred to the Great Plains to fight the Sioux, he warned against a new policy that ordered all the Apaches from their small homeland reserves 
to the reservation at San Carlos, north of the Gila. Members of the band, led so long by Cochise, now dead, promptly vanished into Mexico. Under new daring leaders, the last and most notorious of whom was Geronimo, about 150 crafty renegades began a repetitive process that continued for 11 years. They would cross the border to raid in Arizona and New Mexico, race back to the mountains of Sonora, be pursued, finally surrender, return to the reservation, and break out again. In many cases, the Apaches' complaints about the reservation life were justified. Not only had they been herded from their homelands, but they had also been promised rations, goods, and farm supplies that often were never received. One army officer declared that less than 20% of what was appropriated by Congress for the Indians ever reached them, and Crook, reassigned to Arizona after 1882, was frequently in conflict with, quote, that thieving Indian Bureau of the Interior Department, unquote. The last time Geronimo slipped away with only 20 followers, he raided for four months, all the while eluding 5,000 American troops who took turns guarding waterholes and patrolling southern Arizona. At last, a few Apache scouts and soldiers under Lieutenant Colonel Charles Gatewood found the band and pursued them to surrender. On September 8, 1886, they were taken away under heavy guard to the Southern Pacific Station near Fort Bowie. The little remnant of one of the most amazing fighting forces the world had ever seen was put aboard a train for Florida, and Geronimo never saw Arizona again. He stands defiant, right hand on the hip, the thin lips of its deep-set mouth turned down at the corners. His stocky torso is bound by a cheap, wrinkled coat. His calloused feet are pinched into new cavalry boots. Dangling front and back is the long, full Apache breechcloth over white riding breeches. He is old and battered. A bullet is lodged in his right knee. Scars of other gunshots and saber wounds mark his body. His wide-brimmed hat covers a head dented by a rifle butt. He is Geronimo, about to depart for the railroad station and the long journey to exile. The 4th Cavalry Band serenades him. It is a brassy and ironic rendition of Auld Lang Syne. Ironic for the old chieftain and his longtime adversaries, yet perhaps a fitting theme song for the memories that will forever haunt the Gila Trail. <laughs>